Reaction Beanie Yo 454 Dating that neighborhood My brothers and sisters It is officially the first day of spring 2024 And it's also the first day this year In 2024 When we gonna check out a video from this man channel And that man is Kevin From Just Thought Lounge Back to Just Thought Lounge, y'all. It has been way too long since we last checked out a video from this man. And just last week, y'all, just last week, Kevin, he had commented on the Lazy Masquerade video that I put out last week. And I'm going to put the comment up right now just so y'all can see what he said and what I said and all that. And just for me, man, like personally, it's just always such a great and amazing feeling when some of these amazing YouTube content creators that we watch over here actually leave a comment on our videos, just like giving us the stamp of approval. You know what I'm saying, man? Shout out to you, Kevin, bro. I love your freaking content. And I'm starting to keep a tab, y'all. I'm starting now to keep a tab on all these uh, guys who've been leaving comments over here on our videos so far. We have had Adrian from Coffee House Crying leave a comment. We have had AJ from the White File leave a comment. We just got Kevin from Just All Lounge left a comment. We have had Ryan from Tragedy Tales leave a lot of comments. And Jose Ortiz from Evil Intentions. Not only have he left a comment, he actually put up a post on his page about our channel. You know what I'm saying, man? So I would just always feel great about that just knowing that these guys like me reacting to these videos. Because for for me, it's, it's a privilege to watch these videos with y'all. Like, that's just how much I enjoy doing this. But I digress. Hope y'all doing excelente out there today. And I'm glad that you came on back to the channel once again. To fuck with the bean. And the title of this video is... The Murder of Douglas Benefield. True Crime Documentary. Man, I really don't know what to say for y'all other than this right here. Get whatever you may need. Get what you need, please. We back to Kevin from Just Thought Lounge. Y'all got what y'all need? Y'all ready to go? Then let's and go. On the 27th of September, 2020, Former ballet dancer Ashley Benefield shot and killed her husband in the Lakewood Ranch neighborhood of Manatee County, Florida. From that moment onwards, she has claimed that she did so in self-defense. She was in fear for her life. But many, including county investigators and prosecutors, doubted the young mother's claims, and with good reason. This would not be the first time that Ashley Benefield made shocking accusations regarding her husband. In all of her stories, there seem to be seeds of truth, a scattering of facts that can be supported, but spiraling out from them are almost unbelievable allegations. Mm. How much of Ashley Benefield's tales are true? Hi everyone, I'm Kevin and welcome to Just Thought Lounge. Today's case is a recent one, and it's unlike any other we have covered so far. Some viewers will no doubt comfortably reach a conclusion based on what we know about this couple and their history, but there is no question that this case is a messy one. Let's take a look. Get whatever you may need. And it just seemed like one of those cases where you either gonna believe her or you're not. You know what I'm saying? It seemed that cut and dry. And I wanna see the type of 
case that she make for herself to make us believe that she is innocent. Y'all get what I'm saying, man? Do that make sense how I said that? I hope it do. But let's go. Douglas Benefield started each day by sending a Bible verse to the most important women in his life, his teenage daughter Eva and his young wife Ashley. In the autumn of 2020, Doug and Ashley had been married for almost four years. Along with their three-year-old daughter and Ashley's mother Alicia, the couple were planning a move from the Lakewood Ranch neighborhood in Florida to Ashley's home state of Maryland. In the days before the scheduled move, the family ate out. They joked around over text. They packed up boxes. Doug made runs out for last-minute supplies. Doug seemed to be having fun with all the chaos and excitement that can come with moving house. Get real. <laughs> Ashley and mother Alicia organized the belongings in the house while Doug cleared out his nearby apartment. A regular resident of South Carolina, Doug had rented the second home to be near to his wife and daughter while she stayed with her mother. When they landed in Maryland, however, they planned to be together. Doug was optimistic that this was the fresh start that his family needed. And it's just so crazy, y'all. If you just read those text messages, messages right there, man, you could just see the excitement and the love in the family and how everybody just having a good time and just loving each other. And then at the snap of a finger, uh, it, everything just go to hell. You know what I'm saying, man? And I keep it real. I'm going to keep it real. Me personally, I can vouch for that as far as relationships. You know what I'm saying? You have those great freaking moments where everything is all good and kind and candy and freaking cherries on top of the cake and then boy the cake turned to a, a, a shit pile <laughs> i'm just saying man it's just crazy how it just can flip on his head like that but let's go At just past 5.30 p.m. on September 27, 2020, two days before they were scheduled to move, Doug sent his last text message. It was to his wife. He was driving a rented U-Haul truck to the house to fill with Ashley's belongings. In a joking and excited tone, the 58-year-old typed, Trucker on the way. Shortly after sending that text, Doug Benefield arrived with the moving truck at the Florida home. But he was not going to make it to Maryland. Less mm. than an hour and a half later, a neighbor placed a call to 911. Ashley Benefield had run to his door, hysterical, asking for help. She carried one of her handguns. She had just shot her husband, she said. It was self-defense. Ashley's cries can be heard in the background of the emergency call. She's with me now, quite upset. The weapon is here. We need the police before the mother, the, her mother, and the little girl gets back from the park. I don't want them to find this. So you, they were in an argument? I don't know. I, I she came in it was quite hysterical. I said that he attacked her and she got him. They've been having trouble. Responding officers and medical personnel found Doug on the floor of Ashley's bedroom. They attempted to save his life, but they were unsuccessful. Inside the largely empty house, officers determined that multiple shots had been fired. They found a stray bullet on the floor and two more lodged in the wall. At least one of these two gunshots had struck Doug, while at least one bullet had found its way into a bathroom door. The initial assessment, which was later revised, was that Doug Benefield had been shot twice once in the leg and once in his arm. This second gunshot, according to these early reports, moved through his arm to penetrate his chest. Police promptly obtained the weapon, a 45 caliber handgun, but also located two additional firearms in the house. Almost every item in the house had been packed into boxes, 
Yet, there was another gun in a small container in the kitchen pantry, as well as a 380 caliber that Ashley Benefield kept in her backpack. Both were loaded. A lot of guns. Oh, uh, Ashley got in all uh, her um around her house. You know what I'm saying? She got them like look kind of like and just to me, just a little speculation. I'm not saying I believe it for real, y'all. But I'm just saying, man, that they kind of look like premeditated and very circumstantial how she got those freaking weapons laying around her house. I don't know. Let's go. What was notably missing was a second weapon used in the encounter one potentially wielded by Doug, the alleged attacker. Had he been attacking Ashley as she claimed, there was no indication that he had been armed with a gun, knife, bat, or anything else. Mm. And another thing is, it's like, dude, y'all was getting ready to move. Y'all was so excited through the text messages. Y'all see that, what I'm saying, man, how shit can just go from shits and giggles to shit and all, oh, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, it can just flip so fast. It seemed like everything was going good with them. So what the freak happened? I don't, I like, okay, if, if he did attack you. You got to tell us why. What was it? Because it just seems so random and out of place for the situation right now. At the police station, Ashley was photographed with a scratch on her side. She also arguably showed redness and swelling under her left eye. There were no other scratches or bruises found on her person. If investigators at this early stage suspected that the claim of self-defense was bogus, they would not be offered any clarity by Ashley Benefield. The 28-year-old arrived at the Manatee County Police Department, escorted by her lawyer, who had reportedly managed to arrive at the house within minutes of the emergency call. With her attorney advising her to stay quiet, Ashley said nothing more. Back in 2015, Ashley Byers was a valued member of the Donald Trump presidential campaign. She also had a side gig as a swimsuit model. But her true passion was the ballet. A youth dancer when she had lived in Maryland, Ashley had dreams of establishing her own company. She conceived of a business endeavor that merged her love of dance with the values of inclusivity. A diverse group of dancers like her, bursting with potential, but for superficial reasons, had never had a big break. Ashley's dream company would take the ballet world by storm. These dreams began to form into a reality when, in the summer of 2016, she met a handsome and well-off widower at the Palm Beach home of once presidential candidate Ben Carson. Carson had ended his campaign, but was still active with donors. Doug Benefield ran in these circles. Upon their first meeting, 54-year-old Doug was said to have been captivated. His cousin called him starstruck by the 24-year-old dancer. It was reported that the couple bonded over, quote, their love of God and the Second Amendment. They couldn't stop talking. It was love at first sight. Their meeting that night spawned a whirlwind romance. Just 13 days later, the two were married. Two days later, did I just hear that right? Jesus Christ, man, slow it down a little bit, man. Golly, God damn, my brothers and sisters. But the only thing on my mind right now that I cannot stop thinking about is why. Why did this happen? Like, what kind of argument? Like, dude, y'all was good. And then all of a sudden, this happened? It just seems so out of nowhere. But those freaking guns being placed meticulously in the house i'm still kind of suspicious on that but i'm just still like y'all why i need some answers from ashley i need answers doug benefield was a veteran he had been a pilot in the u.s navy in 2016 he worked in the military technology industry developing new tech for a variety of uses he had also been successful in his other business endeavors, from restaurants to real estate. Doug promptly secured investment for the couple's ambitious new enterprise, Ashley's dream of a revolutionary ballet company, the American National Ballet. 
Doug would also spend as much of his own funds as possible to ensure that the initiative would take off. Meanwhile, at his home in South Carolina, Doug moved his new wife into the family home with his 15-year-old daughter, Eva. Home life from that point onwards grew rocky. Mm -mm. A close friend of Eva's moved in shortly thereafter, further increasing the tensions in the household. Friendly overtures made by Ashley towards the two teenage girls fell flat. Her attempts at bonding were overshadowed by what seemed like a ceaseless desire by the ballet dancer to always remain the primary focus of Doug's attention. Her behavior was not welcomed by Eva, who was experiencing a difficult period in her life. Only nine months earlier, the young teen had returned home to find her mother, 56-year-old Renee Benefield, collapsed from a heart attack. Oh, Renee man. had passed away as the result of an undiagnosed heart condition. It was a shocking and devastating loss. Yeah, I know that's tough for her, man. The uh, Douglas little girl, that's tough for her. She just lost her mama a couple of months ago, and now this new lady coming in my daddy life and my life in our home. You know what I'm saying? So I can just feel her on that. And then she a younger lady, too. Like, I don't know, man. Oh, this, this right here is a tough situation for everybody to feel like the me. Less than a year later, Doug and his new wife pushed forward with their big plans. Developing the American National Ballet and getting pregnant. Dancers from all over the world obtained their U.S. work visas and flew into Charleston, prepared to make their name with the American National Ballet. Meanwhile, the company's two founders were having more and more problems. Apparently, Ashley began to grate on the nerves of her older husband. In spring 2017, after reading her stepdaughter's diary, Ashley discovered that her attempts to win over the teenager had failed miserably. Eva, as she read in the diary, deeply disliked her. This discovery prompted a confrontation with Doug. During the ensuing argument, Doug fired a gun at the ceiling of the family kitchen. He later told his cousin that he did so in frustration when his wife refused to stop talking. Doug also admitted to an incident where he threw a handgun towards a wall and punched his fist straight into one. Despite the growing frustrations, at least at first, Doug and Ashley carried on, presenting a united and happy front. Just a few days after Doug had fired a gun inside his own kitchen, the couple hosted a lavish wedding reception at a hotel in downtown Charleston. Looking at the smiling couple that night, no one in attendance would have suspected deep-seated tensions brewing under the surface of their marriage. The following July, Doug and Ashley learned they had been successful. Ashley was pregnant. But by August, she had packed up and it left South Carolina. At first, Ashley told Doug that she was experiencing serious bouts of nausea due to her pregnancy and thought it was sensible to stay for a time with her mother in Florida. Several weeks later, however, Ashley secretly returned to their home in Charleston. She packed up many of her remaining belongings and left her husband a note. She wrote that she was scared for her life. She was scared for her unborn baby. She was leaving him and asked him not to contact her. Hey, I'm 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 finna say something, y'all, and I hope y'all don't take it the wrong way. I'm serious, man. I'm serious. Just follow me, my brothers and sisters. Just follow me. Okay. This girl is basically saying, Ashley, she's saying she left him. She went stay with her mama a little while. Then she decided, I guess, while she was staying with her mama, that no, I need to leave him for good. So she came back, got the rest of her stuff, and took off and left this note. Saying that she is scared of this man. Now, God bless the dead. I'm not trying to talk bad about Douglas or nothing. But just me personally, I can kind of understand where she coming from if y'all just read the note and understand this situation. And it's just one reason why I'm saying that. Because Douglas got mad one day. And just because she wouldn't stop talking, he shot the gun off in their kitchen into the roof, into the ceiling. 
Would you want to stay with somebody who get mad and start shooting in the house? So I, I'm just saying, man, I'm not saying that this right here excuse for what she end up doing to him. But just right now, as far as what's going on, I understand where she coming from. I really do, y'all. I really do. Not trying to make her be the victim of nothing. Not doing all that. But I understand, dude, because if, if my damn girlfriend get to shooting in the damn house, I probably won't never be in that house no more with her crazy ass. I'm Now I'm starting to be stupid. Let's go. Left without the company founder who had knowledge of the industry, the American National Ballet essentially crumbled. Doug placed the business under new leadership, which promptly made the decision to fire half of the dancers. From Florida, Ashley wrote that she was devastated, but she did not return to South Carolina. Instead, she began filing a series of complaints against her husband to law enforcement in Florida. During this period, the expecting mother began to believe, or at least to tell others, that Doug had been poisoning her and her unborn child. The nausea that she was experiencing, she said, was too extreme, even for a pregnancy. Doug must have been putting something into her tea. She went to the police in Manatee County and reported the poisoning. She took with her a tea set, which had been sent to her from her husband as a birthday gift, wrapped in plastic, to the police station and requested testing for toxins. Mm. Ashley even made accusations that Renee Benefield had not in fact died of natural causes. Doug had poisoned his previous wife as well, she alleged. Renee's autopsy revealed a heart condition and it showed that 75% of her arteries had been blocked at the time of her death. There was Dang. no indication of poisoning. Regardless, convinced that she had found him out, Ashley sent in hairs to a private lab for testing. Then, as her due date neared, she scheduled a C-section and secretly gave birth to a daughter. Doug Benefield was not informed of the birth. Ashley did not list his name as the father on the birth certificate. Six months later, in 2018, the two began a fight for visitation rights. At the hearing in family court, Ashley testified that Doug Benefield was dangerous, that he had told her, essentially, that he was a serial killer who poisoned people. He said that he is a good killer because he's angry. He had insinuated that outside of the military that he had connections and that he could kill people, that he could make people disappear, um, that he had murdered people, poisoned people, that he had gotten away with both, and that um, he could do it again, and that nobody would ever find out, and nobody could ever prove what he did. And see, this one, now I have a problem with Ashley, because I don't, I don't believe this shit. Like, I don't know, man, I don't, I... If, if she may be telling truths, but they have truths. You know what I'm saying, man? I don't believe everything that she is saying about Douglas as far as he have killed. He say he have killed people and he can kill people and he got connections and he even poisoned people before and all this and that. I don't believe all that now. I was just saying earlier about that situation as far as because he shot that gun, but... At the same time, maybe he was telling her all this stuff. I don't know, y'all, but if I had to believe so... So far in this video, I would believe that, nah, I don't believe he was saying all that. Like I said, if he was saying this, it was just some of it. It was half-truths that Ashley is telling to these police. Let's go. Ashley went on to describe incidents that made her fearful of her husband. The encounter with the gun in the kitchen, as well as episodes of erratic driving when he was angry with her. Stacked upon these allegations were assertions that Doug had placed a tracker on her car and had been spotted by a neighbor watching her through her window at night. Ashley never accused Doug of becoming physical or violent towards her, only of scaring her. For the purposes of the legal hearing, this distinction was significant. He started accusing me of not loving him and said that if I had loved him, that I would have responded with a kissing emoji or a heart back. He started accusing me of possibly having 
a relationship with somebody else. Um, so this just proved that he loved me more than I loved him. Um, I, of course, told him that, you know, none of that was true, but he became more and more angry, turned to walk away from me. And um, he was standing in the opening of the closet and I was standing right on the outside of the closet. And he turned around and he punched a hole through the wall with his fist. What Ashley and another thing that I hate about this story and a lot of stores and just all this stuff in general, period, man, is when somebody dies and it's like you only can get one side of the story because the person who died can never tell their side of the story. You know what I'm saying? She's saying all this stuff about him, but we can never hear his rebuttal or his side of it, man. So I that's just a uh, I, it's, it's life man it's life it's just how it goes but it's still just elfed up he did allege was that levels of heavy metals detected in her system and that of her daughter were proof that doug had been poisoning them both Found heavy metals in your daughter as well yes okay and all those reports have now been admitted into evidence correct? yes and do those um reports cause you concern based on your reading of them yes and why um because they're not normal levels for either either of us to have. It, there are very high levels of strange metals that are not necessarily common. <laughs> okay. And when your daughter was born, she had these uh, heavy metals in her system? Yes. The meconium would have been dated back to the early weeks of gestation. Okay. And they're the same heavy metals that you have in your system, correct? Yes. Man, I know I keep uh, pausing the damn video, but it's like the more and more I listen to her, the more and more her shit starting to sound like bullshit. Y'all, like seriously, man, these heavy metals and stuff. Look, if he hypothetically, if he wanted to poison you or your daughter, it, it, it only take one time. You ain't got to be doing it over and over again and building up these heavy metals in your system. He could feed you one thing that would knock your ass out and you would never wake up again if that's what he wanted to do. So I don't know, man. Did she, y'all heard the little chuckle she gave right then? Like she laughing. <laughs> like she laughing about the situation, man. I'm sorry, y'all. It's like the more she talked, the more unconvincible she starting to sound to me. Doug's attorney, Stephanie Murphy, questioned the validity of the toxicology results. The lab, Carlson Company, found dangerous levels of aluminum, cobalt, zinc, tin, and barium in her body. They explained the increased levels of these heavy metals in her system unambiguously to the judge at the hearing. They stated that Ashley Benefield had been intentionally and systematically poisoned. Countering these ostensibly clear results, were medical records made throughout her pregnancy by Ashley's OBGYN and other professionals who found her to be in perfect health. You said that you were sick from January 2000, 2017 forward, is that right? Um, I began displaying symptoms around that time, yeah. These are your low country OBGYN. Do you recognize these? Yes. You see in the middle of that box, it says, denies lower GI symptoms. You see that? Mm -hmm. Has regular, normal formed bowel movements without pain or bleeding. You see that? Mm -hmm. Denies new or acute muscle or bone pain. You see that? Yes. Denies skin or hair changes. Is that correct? Yes, it says that. And these are all statements that you made to your doctor on April 26, 2017. Is that correct? That's what's recorded in these records, yes. So are you saying is Low Country lying about this, or is this an accurate reflection of what you said to the doctor? Um, I believe it's fairly accurate. There are multiple times in the records that I have been reviewing over the past couple months where things aren't what I said they were and they were written incorrectly. Um. In a strongly worded decision delivered by the family court judge, Ashley's claims against Doug were criticized. Judge Diana Moreland found absolutely no evidence to support Ashley's claim that she had been poisoned. She found that the testimony from Carlson Company had been completely discredited by the opposing expert. 
and says she goes through with this lavish wedding. She goes on uh, developing a um, ballet with uh, her husband at that time, posing in magazines, um, portraying to everybody in the world that this is a very happy marriage, that we're going down, we're going to start this national ballet. During all this period of time, what we have is a household that is continuing on, instead of uh, uh, being in the home, not making anyone alert. The medical records are, are uh, devoid of any conversations between her and uh, people that would have been uh, providing protection, those being doctors, etc., indicating in the least that she has a type of poisoning uh, that is appearing in her system, that she has been the victim of domestic <laughs> violence. The actual presentation that she's had in the courtroom since she entered into the courtroom, uh, the turning on of tears when uh, she thinks it's appropriate. Hmm. Not a single scintilla of credible evidence that Miss Benefield had ever been poisoned or suffered from any illness of any poison. And that's what I'm saying, man. I don't believe that it's not one iota. You know what I'm saying? When she started coming up with all these conspiracies about you were poisoning and stuff, that's when you just lost all credibility for me, man. And then you already told on yourself years ago, back in 2017, when you was telling your OBGYN that you are medically cleared. You feel good. You ain't dealing with nothing. But now all of a sudden, uh, he was poisoning you. Get the F out of here, man. And those people who come up and try to help protect her these freaking defense attorneys defense lawyers and all that then y'all should just be a freaking shame of y'all self man y'all do all that for the money man and i just couldn't live with myself telling lies for the money let's go the decision by the family court awarded doug time sharing with his daughter she was six months old when they would meet for the first time Damn. When it came time to arrange the first visit, Ashley did something that no one was expecting. She happily agreed to the arrangement. She suggested that perhaps the three of them could spend time together as a family. Somehow, the couple began a process of reconciliation. Or did they? In late 2020, Ashley Benefield was arrested and charged with the second-degree murder of her husband. The state of Florida argued that Ashley was motivated to kill Doug to keep him out of her daughter's life. Whether real or imagined, the abuse that Ashley reported suffering had motivated her to fake a reconciliation with him. Once in 2018, after the family court decision, and then, as the state planned to argue, again in 2020, before she killed him. Ashley's first line of legal defense was a stand your ground hearing. Under Florida law, Ashley could be deemed immune from prosecution if her use of deadly force was in self-defense and it occurred inside her home. The hearing took place in September 2023. Ashley had been released on bond and lived near to her mother and daughter in Florida. The former ballerina had never offered a formal statement to law enforcement about what she claimed happened inside her bedroom on the night Doug died. Fragments of Ashley's version of events began to trickle out as evidence was presented in court. Her attorney argued that she had tried to kick Doug out of the house, but that he refused to go. When she tried to leave, he grabbed at her left wrist and blocked the door. It had been widely reported after her arrest that Ashley Benefield's self-defense claim would not hold water for one central reason. That Doug had been shot in the back. He appeared oh. to be retreating, not attacking. And that's one of the most telltale signs, man, that it's not self-defense. When he just it, when uh, the victim end up with gunshots wound to the back, especially multiple ones, you know what I'm saying? It's very hard to believe that you were trying to protect yourself when his back was to you. More than likely, he was running away, you know what I'm saying? That's like common sense, common knowledge. But... My whole stance on this video has changed so much, y'all. Like, Kevin has took us on a ride, man, because when I first started watching it and thinking about her, I, it was like, 
okay, let me let me hear your side of the story. You know what I'm saying? I'm 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 not gonna really believe that you are guilty in this case, but let me hear your side of the story. And it's like now that we know her side of the story and the history between these two. Man, I ain't gonna say I'm 100% believing that she pretty much just murdered this man, no self defense, no nothing. But boy, I'm probably like, I'm like 95% convinced that she did, man. I think this lady freaking murdered this dude. Let's go. However, when medical examiner Dr. Russ Vega took the stand to explain the injuries that Doug sustained, this reporting proved to be, at least in part, inaccurate. Four gunshots had been fired. The fatal shot had struck Doug's chest. He also sustained a gunshot, however, to the back of the leg. A third bullet likely grazed his arm. The fourth missed entirely. Okay. So the path that the bullet took was across his chest from right to left. Okay. Um, it was also somewhat from front to back. The order of the gunshots could not be medically determined. The state theorized that the location of the fatal shot to Doug's side could be explained by his attempt to turn and run from the loaded weapon. In this scenario, the shot to his leg came just afterward when he tried to run from the room. Ashley's attorney had a different theory. Doug was known to be quite athletic, a wrestler in his youth and a fan of CrossFit in later life. Doug was also, according to Ashley's attorney, trained in martial arts. The implication was that Doug himself had been the weapon. Posed slightly to the side in a ready position to deliver some kind of karate move when he was shot. Could his leg then have been hit while performing a karate kick? It would have to be a unique kind of kick to, from the front, in a standing position, be able to expose the back of the leg um, I they, they just reaching now, man. Now we just reaching, man. We, man, come on, man. Seriously, seriously, stop it. Stop. I suppose it is possible if the leg were raised high enough that it, the back of it were exposed to the person who's facing that individual. Manatee County Sheriff Detective Justin Warren, who led the investigation, was questioned about Ashley's potential injuries. In particular, he was asked about the scratch on her side that was photographed on the night of the shooting. The detective's arrest affidavit stated that the scratch was already a day old. However, mm. Ashley had told a witness, interviewed by law enforcement before her arrest, that the scratch was a result of Doug's progressively aggressive behavior towards her. That afternoon, he had intentionally and forcefully body checked her with a moving box, she had stated, which had scratched her side. Uh, do they depict scratches on Miss Benefield on the evening of this incident? Uh, they appear to. Okay, and do the scratches appear fresh? Um, the, are, I, would, are, I don't think the nest or the one up under the sports bra appears. Are they, be. what color are they? Are they pink? Like I said, I'm not a color palette expert, but I would go with sure. It could be pink or red. Okay, are any of them scabbed? Um, it's kind of hard to tell because they're so minute. Uh, do you see any scab? No, and I don't actually even see an open wound on this one that would scab over, so. Okay, let me show you the photographs. Forensic teams tested the t-shirt that Doug was wearing to determine if any gunshot residue was present. Assuming that Doug had been in close proximity to Ashley, as he would have been if posed, ready to perform a karate move of some kind, there should have been a stippling on his shirt, a burning left by the gunpowder that fired out of the gun along with the bullet. But the testing found none. The forensic expert testified that based on this, the gun was likely fired from a distance of over three feet away. It would expect it to be somewhere around three feet. You'd expect us to see it there. Okay. And I have previously on this occasion assaulted you, and now I am coming at you again to assault you. You're telling us that you shot me, and when you shot me, I was four feet or more away from you. Potentially. Yeah. That 
You chose not to let me get closer than that to assault you a second time. The I just can't believe that we even trying to argue this point of him doing some type of karate move and that's why she was shooting him. Like, what are we doing, man? And I get it, though, at the same time. Yes, we got to throw every possibility and every scenario and take all of them serious of maybe that's what happened. But I don't believe that what happened for not one minute second. My brothers and sisters are like, no, man, hell no. Physical evidence did not present a clear case of self-defense, but the burden was on the state to prove that the shooting was more likely a murder. To do yes. this, they examined why Ashley Benefield would have wanted her husband dead. To understand Ashley's motive required tracing the last twists and turns that the marriage took after the 2018 family court hearing. Following Judge Moreland's decision, the two had began spending time together once more going to the beach, playing with their daughter, and having dinners out. That is, until Doug hired a private investigator. He mm. found out that Ashley had moved on with another man and appeared to have no intention of reconciling with him after all. Doug filed for divorce, and the couple formally separated. The roller coaster of the Benefield marriage, however, was not yet over. Ashley filed multiple complaints with the Manatee County Sheriff's Office, now making very clear accusations of abusive behavior by Doug. But she no longer alleged this behavior was directed towards her, but rather towards their daughter. Let's start with the first allegation that came in in 2019, uh, the date of December. You eventually just closed that case with no charges, correct? That's correct. All right. Detective Brian Moreland, who is no relation to Judge Moreland from the family court, testified to additional complaints filed by Ashley on March 21st, 2020, and then again on March 23rd. This case was closed with no charges. Another allegation was made on April 5th, then again later in the month on the 27th. CPS, or Child Protective Services, launched multiple investigations. Sheriff's deputies also followed up on Ashley's claims. Doug's daughter, Eva, defended him to law enforcement making inquiries in South Carolina. Each time, they found no evidence to support Ashley's accusations. After multiple agencies came to the same conclusion over and over, the Manatee Sheriff's Office took the next reasonable step. They ordered psychological testing. Mm. To the amazement of those close to Doug Benefield, by the time of his death in September 2020, he was once again ostensibly reconciling with his young wife, despite their previous difficulties. Testimony from Doug's cousin, Tommy, with whom he had been very close, began to piece together some of Doug's perspective. Tommy testified that his cousin had routinely made excuses for Ashley's behavior. Doug remained in love with her throughout their separation. Doug was said to have been forgiving of her to a fault until the day he died. During the time that you encountered Doug and Ashley together and, and talking to Doug, how did he act about Ashley? He was completely in love, completely supportive, starstruck, um, visibly, uh, physically, you could tell by the way he treated her, took care of her on the opening night that I met him, uh, met her, and then it continued through the entire relationship. Doug's attorney handling the timesharing of his daughter and the pending divorce, Stephanie Murphy, testified to the developments in the relationship in the days before Doug's death. On the brink of an apparent fresh start, which included their move to Maryland, the couple attended a mediation to sort through the pending legal issues stemming from the separation, including Ashley's attempt to get a protective injunction against Doug. At some point after the mediation, did Ashley agree to drop the injunction? Oh, she had agreed to drop the injunction before the mediation, but it wasn't just that she was going to drop it. It was a quid pro quo situation. And what was the quid pro quo? That he dismissed his divorce case and the 
again, another emergency motion for time sharing for the parenting plan um, and the joint motion to release the psychological evaluations conducted by Dr. Brad Broder. Man, this story right here is so frustrating for me, y'all, because it's like you got so many different people with so many different stories and perspectives and stuff. It's like this this is politics. You got hard lefts and hard rights. You know what I'm saying, man? You got certain people saying that, hey, this is what happened as far as Ashley goes. Douglas was this this abusive guy, and he was he poisoned her, and he tried to do all this, and he tried to do all Oh, that he was such a horrible man but then you go to the left side from the right side and you got these people saying that ashley crazy as fuck ashley been doing this as been doing that douglas was a great i uh, mean a great man and he loved her and all this and that and it's just like dude man so many different people saying so many, many different things it's hard for you to really like really want to believe any damn body you know what i'm saying man Oh, I just hate at the end of the day that Douglas is not here today to tell his side of the story. That's the part that's getting on my nerves more than anything. We almost done, y'all. Let's go. The release of the psych evaluations were key. Doug agreed to all other points, but refused to stop the divorce until after the psychological results were released. That hearing was only three days away when he was killed. And what day was Doug murdered? He was murdered on Sunday, September 27th, 2020. Three, three days before this hearing was scheduled. Three days after the mediation, three days before the court date. And who was the judge scheduled to be at this hearing on the 30th? Chief Judge Diana Moreland. So the same judge that had heard the rest? Same judge. Hmm. Ashley did not want to go in front of Judge Moreland again. Her previous decision from 2018 was less than favorable to Ashley, and the judge had, for all intents and purposes, determined that she was a liar. Ashley also had reason to want to avoid the disclosure of the psychologist's report. Dr. Brad Broder is a clinical psychologist who sat with both Doug and Ashley, individually and then as a couple. It was his report that was to be presented at the final hearing, that would have taken place three days after Doug's death. When the state called to Dr. Broder, they told the judge that he would testify that Ashley Benefield suffered from paranoia, that she often exaggerated facts, and that she tested as an extremely manipulative personality. Ashley could not have known the doctor's conclusions, but she would have been aware of what she had admitted to him during their sessions that she had no intention of reconciling with her husband. Uh, she made it very clear on more than one occasion that she had no uh, intention of reconciling with Doug and that she had every intention of relocating to Maryland. Uh, and did she indicate to you that she was going to go without Doug? Okay. Go to Maryland without Doug? Uh, Again, in several different occasions, she had indicated that was her intention. She did not want him uh, to come along with her. There was uh, some email exchanges indicating that she was trying to make that happen. Uh, he had made it clear that he was going to be going there and thought that he'd be moving in with them, which she clearly made clear to me that that was not going to happen. Okay. So she made clear to you that he is not moving in. We are not getting back together. Yeah, absolutely. Did she say those things and act that way during the joint session with, with Doug? No. Okay. How was it different? It was different in that her um, presentation of herself was more deferential to Doug um, because her, her goal, as she had shared with me, was to, in essence, kind of appease him, go along with him, you know, because she was concerned he might uh, get angry and, and blow up. So she wanted to just kind of go, go with the flow, as the expression is, and therefore she was willing to go out to lunch or go to a movie or hang out with him. And mm -hmm. Ashley's family attorney, Faith Brown, told investigators that before Doug's death, Ashley Benefield had purchased a burner phone, rented a car, secured a safe location, and contacted two attorneys. 
On the night of the 27th, she had feared that Doug was catching on to her plan to leave him once more. Her attorney argued that Doug's behavior justified the fear that Ashley felt that night. The state argued that no court in the country would find that blocking a doorway justified murder. Manatee Circuit Court Judge Matthew White ruled that Ashley Benefield wasn't entitled to immunity under the state's Stand Your Ground law. Judge okay. White wrote that, The killing was not an act of self-defense, but was instead the culmination of a lengthy, concerted effort by Ashley Benefield to eliminate Doug from her life and that of their child. Woo! That's a huge statement by the judge. I, I don't know how y'all feel about what he just said, but I, I, I'm i riding with it. You know what I'm saying? I agree with him, man. I don't think at the end of the day, y'all, long story short, short story long, that this was self-defense. I don't feel like that. I don't feel like that. I feel like this lady murdered him, point blank, period. When her efforts to enlist the assistance of law enforcement, the Child Protective Services, and the judicial system failed, she took matters into her own hands, just as she had told Dr. Broder that she would. The ruling does not prevent Ashley from claiming self-defense in a jury trial. At the time of publication, a trial date has been tentatively set for July 22nd or July 29th, 2024. And that was the tragic case of Ashley and Doug Benefield. Thanks again to everyone that watches and supports what we do. And a special thank you to our channel members. I'm Kevin. This is Jamie. We're Just Thought Lounge. And I'll see you in the next one. Oh, man, man. God damn, my brothers and sisters. I did not know we was going to end on a cliffhanger. Like, I didn't. I thought we was going to get some closure. It's not a, well, for now, it's an unsolved mystery or whatever that may be solved, may get some closure, but I thought we was going to get it. I thought we was going to hear that Ashley got life in prison before we got to the end of this goddamn video, man. Oh, man. It's, it's an ongoing case. It's an ongoing case, man. And I hope that she end up do at least getting life in prison. Because like I just said earlier, y'all. It is so much to unpack from this story, man. It is so much. It is so much evidence. It is so many words and different people, witnesses and different claims and all this and that. And so many different ways that people trying to turn it. And the most ridiculous thing is talking about a karate kick and trying to justify that as the reason that why she shot him in self-defense. That is just crazy as hell to me. But it's so much in this story, man man but if i had to just make a choice if i had to say what i believe my brothers and sisters i believe she murdered that man that i mean and i tend to believe that it was premeditated like she knew she was gonna do that like she never really had no real intentions on moving with him to this new location and this new home and all that and rekindling their relationship and being together and all that at the end of the day i don't believe that because some of her stories and even uh kevin said it y'all he said it and i had said it before him man a lot of the stories that she was telling they may be half truths but it's not the full truth. Like, you can just tell, like, you exaggerating a little bit. You can use a little hyperbole with a lot of this stuff you saying. Oh, man, my brothers and sisters. Rest in peace to freaking Douglas, man, as always. Rest in peace to all the victims that we watch from these stories. I just hope and pray that justice is served for him and his family. And I just got to say, Kevin has dropped bad listen. This was so freaking great, y'all. Like, it's so unique. All these YouTube crime content creators that we watch over here got their own style and are so unique with how they do it. And this man is a great freaking storyteller. I like the production. I like the way he just laid out. And we most definitely got to come back to his channel very soon, my brothers and sisters. But I digress. I'm gonna let y'all go now. Y'all just make sure y'all hit that like button, you comment, subscribe if you ain't did that yet. And come on back tomorrow for another That Chapter Wednesday. 
But until then, my friends, I also got to say this. Love, peace, and happiness. Stay safe. Don't stop. Keep going. Yeah.